Good afternoon. Atlantis is globally one of the most comprehensive, complex, and highly regarded ecosystem models. It has applications in uh, Australia, where it was developed initially, uh, US, Europe, South Africa, and New Zealand. In New Zealand, we have two Atlantis models. We have the one in the Tasman and the Golden Base, and we also have one in the Chatham Rise. Atlantis models are really good uh, computer simulations, basically, of the system. And they're designed to explore what-if type questions. They're designed to explore what-if questions for which we want to be able to explore both top-down controls, such as fishing, and bottom-up controls, such as climate change or sedimentation or changes in light. So they're extremely powerful, but they're also very complex. And that's why getting to know your model is extremely important and no small task. Now, we have two models, and with our two models, we did, until last month, have two modelers. Um, I've been focusing on the Chatham Rise, and the modeler who left last month was focusing on Tasman and Golden Bays. So a lot of this talk is actually focused on the Chatham Rise. However, it is work that is aligned to the Sustainable Seas Project, and it is where the Tasman Bay Golden Bays model will be headed next. And we'll also touch on that as well. So a lot of the work I've done in the last year and a half on the Chatham Rise Atlantis model is really getting to know it. So it's more than just validating it, because we're in multiple dimensions, and we've got an awful lot going into it and an awful lot coming out of it. We need to understand how important the knowledge gaps are, because of course, with so much going into it, there are going to be some. We need to understand the model dynamics and results. We need to run quite a lot of sensitivity analyses to really get a feel for how the model performs as well as doing skill assessments and comparisons to the data that we have available. An Atlantis model is structured spatially using polygons in the horizontal and depth bins in the water column. And it's structured temporarily using 12-hour time steps, which allow for light changes between night and day. And it's structured using some 50-odd species functional groups. Further, we can add in there what well, we do have in there, light and nutrients, primary productivity, zooplankton right up the food chain, whales, migratory species. And we also have fishing, which can either be simple, as we've put it so far for the historical part of the model, or it can be very complex, including effort from fleet-based dynamics and right up to the economics and back down again. So we have feedback loops, we have flow-in effects, and it's one big toy, really, um, although it's also very powerful and can be very useful and has been shown to be so overseas. When we define an Atlantis model, we have, a, like I said, 50-odd species groups. And these are all eating each other, of course. And how the realized diets pan out is the result of quite a lot of interactions. So it's really important that we check that the right species groups are eating the right species groups. Um, the summary plot that we have here on the right, yes, right hand side, uh, the colorful one, this is a, very much a core summary of the predators, uh, the y axes, and the colors are the prey groups. Uh, a plot like this misses a lot of the detail, but it's really useful for a modeler like myself to talk to the biologists that I work with and make sure that we're in the right space. So we can see it at Lamps, for example, that Wadaho are eating mostly salps, which are the red tunicate. That's the very top one. We can see in about the middle of the plot that uh, Kenna and Pawa, which are in the invert commercial herbivores section, are eating mostly algae. So we can just have a broad rest check that these are looking realistic. Furthermore, as the diet check is required, we also need to check that species are growing at about the right, the correct rate, because this is also a result of whether they're eating enough food. So we have von Bertelanthi growth parameters from the literature, and we can check how big the species should look at each age as they go through the model. Providing this is within range, then we're quite happy that we don't suddenly have our hockey, for example, bigger than the whales. We also need to check that the realized natural mortality is about right. Is this microphone turned off? It's okay, you can all hear. <laughs> so uh, the realized natural mortality from the model is also a result of 
predation. So uh, you want to make sure that you have the right amount of predation for the juveniles, for example, right through to the adults. And we can check this in the model before we turn fishing on by looking at the proportion in the age class 1 through to the age class 10 and so on. So long as we have an exponential decay curve that matches what we think it should do from the literature, then we're in the right space. For a lot of the species group, particularly on the Chatham Rise, we have quite uh, succinct stock assessment models for these species. Uh, so we can compare the biomass trajectories to what's coming out of these models. It's quite interesting that these match really well because they're doing it in a slightly different way. So the stock assessment models allow for the ecosystem effects through year class strengths. So if you have a strong year class coming through, it's likely to be from a signal from the ecosystem. We can see this in the fisheries data from examining the size at age, the length at age, as well as pulses in the abundance indices. So in this fishery stock assessment model, they don't so much look at why it is there, but it is there and it is in the model and it's included in the results. That Atlantis is mimicking the same biomass trajectories is in a slightly different way. This is coming through from the, actually from the ecosystem effects, from things like predation release. So we're getting a really good match there, which is a really good sign that the model is, um, with respect to the single species models, responding really well. And also comparing to the true surveys, the uh, figures on the left there, the red bars are the confidence intervals from the true survey that is uh, set up to target Hoki and Hake as well. And it's matching those really well too. The gray bars in those plots are the catches that have been removed from that system. But because it's not just about a whole lot of single species models put together, the interactions and the connectivity is really important. So what I did to try and ex understand where we are with where we're at with this was I did some sensitivity analyses where I perturbed each species functional group in turn, and then I analyzed the flow and effects on the rest of the system. So the species that, for a small change in their own biomass, had a large change in the rest of the system, they were then graded as high in keystoneness. And the species groups that came out for the Chatham Rises highest in keystoneness were hockey, orange ruffy, spiny dogfish, and mctophids. None of these were surprising to see in the top four. So this is a really good sign, again, that the model is functioning as we would like it to do. We did a similar analysis for responsiveness, and we found mctophids, smooth aria, scampi, and barracuda were the most responsive when we were changing other groups. We also explored the effect of bottom-up variability by doing a bootstrapping exercise using the oceanographic variables for salinity, temperature, and water movement. And we found that the most responsive groups to bottom-up variability, diatoms, zooplankton, detritus, bacteria, and scampi. Again, no surprises here. One of the uh, opportunities of developing such a complex model is bringing it together where we look at where our gaps are in data and knowledge and literature research and we can flag which ones might be most important or most influential on our model results and then we can flag those for further research and or sensitivity analyses whenever we're using this model. So I qualitatively graded the species groups by whether they were very well buff, uh, defined where, and whether they performed well in the model through to whether they were poorly defined and or performed poorly in the model. Within the top 13 species groups ranked by keystoneness and responsiveness, the two that really stood out here were the seabird and the cetacean other groups. These are both composite groups where seabird includes all sea and shore birds, and the cetacean other groups includes pilot whales, sperm whales, and dolphins mostly. So we don't know that much about the biomass trajectories of these on the Chatham Rise. And so when we want to explore scenarios using this model in the future, it would be a really good idea to run sensitivities varying these species groups so that we get a feel for whether they're influential in the scenario of interest. So the next steps um, for the Chatham Rise, we're going to be looking at uh, exploring scenarios uh, for climate change and how these might look in this model, and then whether it's chaotic, which is uh, basically how sensitive it is to initial conditions. For the Tasman and Golden Bays, we need to carry out some similar analyses to what we've done with this model, but I think with a bigger focus on the spatial aspect as well as the bottom-up controls, particularly around light and nutrients and sediments. We've also got a 
a simpler ecosystem model of the Tasman and Golden Bays, which is in development at the moment. Monique Lads, who's now at DOC, started the development of this, and Adele at NIWA is continuing it. So this is using EcoPath with EcoSim, which is very similar in that it has the same species groups and it has all the species interactions, but it doesn't have the nutrient or the light effects that we have from the Atlantis model, and it's not spatially defined. So it'll be really useful to compare those two models where we can. And I think that's about where we're at to that. So thank you very much.